We listen for what the Spirit is saying to the church today. We pray for illumination. God of hope, turn our hearts towards outsiders so we can see you in them. Friend of the poor, pick us up when we trip over our foolish feet and put us back on the path of faithfulness. Spirit of blessing, hold our hands as we wander the streets of corruption and greed and lead us to compassion and grace. Amen. Our first reading from the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament is a story set about 2,700 years ago in the ancient kingdom of Israel. It is about Elijah, who was one of the first great prophets. In ancient Israel, a prophet spoke about religion and politics, so Elijah was often in trouble with the king. Oddly enough, although Elijah was an Israelite prophet, our story takes place outside of the land of Israel. A reading from the first book of Kings, chapter 17, verses 8 to 16. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, saying, now go to Zarephath, which brings to Sidon, and live there, for I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he set out and went to Zarephath. He came to the gate of the town. A widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel, so that I may drink. As she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am now gathering a couple of sticks so that I may go home and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Do not be afraid. Go and do as you have said. But first, make me a little cake of it and bring it to me, and afterwards, make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of meal will not be emptied, and the jug of oil will not fail until the day that the Lord sends rains on the earth. She went and did as Elijah said, so that she as well and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of meal was not emptied, neither did the jug of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. Our second reading is a story about a miracle performed by Jesus. A reading from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 7, verses 12 to 17. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. And with her was a, huge, was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the stretcher, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorably on his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. This is God's land. Many have gone before who have honored God by caring for the land in the ways they have lived and in the stories they have shared. In this, the end of Reconciliation Week, we give thanks for the Ghana people who have held as sacred the duty of protecting the land and living in harmony with it. May God honour and bless them now and to eternity. Amen. We've heard two passages this morning beautifully read, one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament. In both cases, a sick son was involved. And we might ask, in both cases, was hunger or poverty involved in those boys' sicknesses? 
After all, their mother was a widow without other means to provide for herself. In both cases, there is a resurrection, a little unusual. In both cases, there is a healer, prophet, saviour figure involved. It's rather easy to get caught up with the miracle healing or the hero saviour. But in an age where miracles are dismissed due to the absence of scientific evidence, and in an age where heroes are more likely to be mutants and less likely to be associated with some spiritual belief or a relationship with some holy other, I wonder if we might take another angle. There is another common thread to the two passages this morning. The widow mother is a key player. As a woman, I'm conscious that over the last 2,000 years, many of the female characters in scripture have had little focused and sustained attention. Often when there is a woman in the story, like these ones, she has no name. Nameless, somewhat like numbers in detention centers, she is depersonalized, somehow made an object within the story rather than understood to be fully human and recognized as being made in the image of God. If we hearken back to Genesis and get the, the passage where God creates mankind or humankind, male and female, God made them in God's image, God made them. In today's passages, we have two nameless women while some of the other characters are personalized with their names being recorded for posterity, these women are rele relegated to being part of an historical sisterhood of stereotyped widows, seemingly valued only for how they served a hero or nurtured their children. I admit to some interest in what it might mean to be a widow. You see, my husband has terminal cancer. So I think about it. What will it be like for me when I am a widow? It's not something that I've really had to think about before. And I feel too young to be in that stereotyping category. And yet I'm conscious that for many people, many, many people, they are widowed very young and much younger than I. How do we understand our vocation or calling in life as women? Certainly, I have roles as daughter, sister, mother, and wife. Yet, I'm also me in my own right. I have an identity. And I'm not defined solely by the roles I hold. I have a name. And my name is known by God, even when others do not know me. In fact, my name, Amelia, if you take the A off either end, you get Mei Li, which is my Chinese name, because I'm half Chinese. I'm also half Scottish Oz, so Scottish Aussie. And some of you knew that I was wearing the Cameron Tartan it's on underneath this. And yes, I have a name. This is one of the reasons why I actually believe that baptism is important. It is not meant to be a ticket to heaven but it is a way of publicly affirming that this named person is loved by God and known by God. And it is a time when a gathered community recognizes, recognizes that this person's life is sacred. This person is to be loved and the community promises always to recognize that the person's life is holy not because of the things they do, but made holy because God loves them and created them. In my last congregation, we often told a story to explain baptism, and we did a thing called sharing the light. Often when there is a baptism, you light a candle off the Christ candle, and you take it and you give it to um, the person being baptized, or if it's an infant, to their parent or godparent. And we say, baby Fred, Fred, this is your light. The light of Christ 
be upon you. When we tell uh, uh, baptism stories at some point in time, if you don't put out the light, then they either set the church on fire or you get wax everywhere. So you tend to change the light. And a way of changing the light is to take a, a candle snuffer and you take it over and you don't just extinguish the light. You take it and hold it over the candle and watch it diminish. And then when you pick it back up again, you see the smoke going off into the whole building. And you go, that's a bit like the Spirit of God filling up the whole room so that everywhere that you go today, you will be touched by the light. I told that story many times in my last congregation to the point where Ray Bell, who was the resident Scot in a Wesleyan Methodist church, Ray loved that story so much that when he died at his funeral, he wanted a changing of the light. He wanted his baptismal candle there and at the committal when we committed his spirit to God or prayed that his, his spirit would be committed to God, he asked that the light be changed so that people would know that his spirit had joined with God. That then became a tradition. And other people in the church asked for the same thing. The symbol of changing the light helped us to make meaning of things that were deeply true but also mysterious. Others were touched by the baptism story and I was approached by two little old ladies, literally little old ladies, Lorna and Julie. Lorna and Julie had both been stalwart members of the congregation for many, many years. They'd both been secretaries of the congregation or chairpersons of the congregation. They'd been elders, they'd been leaders. They had been carers of others. They'd served in the presbytery meetings. And they came to me and said, before we die, we'd like to be baptised. Now, I was a little confused at that point because they'd held leadership positions in the church for decades. I said, of course you've been baptised. It's all right, God recognises that even if you didn't know it at the time. Because it's all about God loving you before you even love God. When you were baptised as infants, um, no problem. You don't need to be baptised again. No, no, we really haven't been baptised. I said, really? But you've held all of these roles in the church. And they said, no, no, we haven't been baptised and we're a bit embarrassed. I said, why? What happened? You've been here for this long. You've had lots of opportunities between then and now. Why haven't you been baptised till now? Oh, well, we were embarrassed. And I said, well, tell me. They were children of the Depression. And when they were young, their brothers were baptised wearing shorts and shirts. But because the families couldn't afford a christening gown, their families were too embarrassed to have them baptised. I was so shocked because a christening gown isn't needed for having a baptism. But the families were so conscious of that 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 prevented that blessing to happen back then. So I told the elders, and so we organised a baptism, and one of them wanted a baptism in her pool. Now, this is a lady who's over 80, but she had her baptism in her pool. And the other one wanted sprinkling with a little bit of water because I wouldn't want to get too wet because I might get pneumonia. That's okay too. But the rest of the church community decided that they wanted to do something a little bit extra special to bless them. So they bought them, or had made, two beautiful white dresses for them because they couldn't get their baptismal gowns when they were little. They decided to get them two beautiful white dresses when they were old. One of those women has since been buried in, in that dress. And it was, just, it was just beautiful that she felt that other people loved her that much that they would do that. 
They were both widows. They didn't have somebody else to do it for them. Now, when I think of the biblical stories and I think of the stories of Ray and Lorna and Julie, I wonder what does God call out in us? Rather than focus on the injustice of being treated as lesser beings because they were girls, our congregation focused on ensuring that Lorna and Julie really knew how deeply loved they were. Both women had lived their long lives well and faithfully, and yet there was more to the story than what they did in life. It was also important to simply be loved, not valued for their achievements, but valued because they were there. As a gathered community, we recognised that it was not their work or beauty or efforts that made them holy. They were created and loved by God, and in baptism, we recognised that God already knew their names. The biblical stories this morning involve people confronting their sense of the mortality of their loved ones. Such knowledge changes our priorities. Being human means acknowledging our life limitations even as we cast dreams and visions of our ideas of heaven. Sacred stories are meant to challenge us to lift beyond the mortal limits, to cast our thinking to beyond. What might our best selves be called to engage with? What if we treated our lives and opportunities as sacred? What if we made every day count? Now, I'm pretty sure the boy Elijah raised up eventually died, and I'm pretty sure the young man Jesus raised up eventually died too. But having been saved from their first death, I wonder what their lives were like. Did they make the most of their second chance? Did they do good? Did they make a difference in the world? Did they recognise how much they had been loved? And did they go on to deeply and generously love others? What impact did their knowledge of their own resurrections have on them? What happens if we get a second chance? These are the wondering questions of faith. Because being a follower of Jesus is not about having all the answers. It's about developing the confidence to live a life of wondering, safe in the knowledge that someone knows our name and loves us. And it's because we know we are named and loved, especially by God, that we are able to name and love others. Indeed, in the Jesus story this morning, there was one little element that stood out for me. Jesus didn't just have mercy on the young man. He had compassion for the widow. He heard her cry and by raising her son provided for her. I'm going to invite you to take a few moments to think about these characters and your own lives. to think about being named and loved by God and what that might mean for you.